Namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone joined in today on our week 65th Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. This talk is being organized by the Central Zoo Authority as part of the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav. The Mahotsav is a 75 week long celebration to commemorate 75 years of India's independence, which falls on the 15th of August 2022. The Central Zoo Authority is taking the celebration forward through a massive outreach campaign entitled Conservation to Coexistence, The People Connect. Under the helm of this campaign, we will be showcasing 75 conservation priority species and 75 zoos, highlighting one species and one zoo each week. We are currently in week 65 of the celebration with the Saris crane as the species in focus and the Shahid Ashfaqullah Khan Zoological Park as the zoo in focus. So joining in today to speak to us on the species is Dr. Gopi Sundar. Dr. Gopi is a scientist with the Seva Mandir uh, with, that is based out of Udaipur, Rajasthan, and he has previously worked as the regional director at the International Crane Foundation and a scientist at the Nature Conservation Foundation before joining his present assignment, uh, wherein his work entails conservation of the species in focus for today, outside protected areas, whilst all working with tribal groups in southern Rajasthan. Dr. Gopi did his doctorate from the University of Minnesota, and he is also the co-chair of the IUCN Stoke, IBIS, and Spoonbill Specialist Groups, apart from being a member of different other IUCN Specialist Groups. He's, he has close to two decades of experience working on the Saras cranes and several other water birds. Dr. Gopi is regarded as an expert on the Saras cranes, and he will speak to us today more on the species in focus. So over to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, madam. I'll just share my uh, talk and jump right into it. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me on this uh, very, very interesting set of uh, talks organized by the Seas a Day. And it has been wonderful to follow uh, a whole bunch of species and also learn so much about the different zoos, many of which, you know, just like many of the species are under the radar. So today, uh, my job here, I've been told is to try and let all of you know uh, a little bit about the species, the Saras crane, which I've been working on since 1998. As people here will know, it's the state bird of Uttar Pradesh and it's the tallest flying bird of the world. The responsibility for the largest population, uh, global population of the Saras crane is with India because that's where most of these cranes occur. Our recent investigations in Australia have shown that the numbers there are actually much higher than what we thought before, but India still remains the core of the species. So uh, these are all the people that uh, I've been working with, my field assistants, my associates, uh, students, uh, colleagues, and I owe a lot of the learning that I've been doing to these people uh, with whom I've been working across Australia, Nepal, and in India. Today's talk will be loosely structured, but the things that I will cover across the talk are where, that is, where are Saras cranes distributed around the world, uh, and particularly where are they found in India, and also, uh, I'll be looking at a little bit about uh, the what of the Saras crane, what do they do, what do they need, and how do they behave. And finally, how do we conserve them? And I'll allude to captive management just a little, but we have uh, uh, much better experts than myself who can talk about captive management of Saras's. So I will not go into that too much, except refer to wild behavior, which may be of use uh, for captive management. I've been working with uh, zoos across India since 1999 uh, with various states. And we've assisted uh, and provided information to uh, a lot of zoos, though in the last eight years or so, we've not been able to keep up in touch. So hopefully through this talk, we'll get back in touch with CZA. And uh, if there is any assistance or any expert uh, uh, knowledge that we can provide, which may help in captive management, I'll be delighted to do that. So where are the Saras cranes found? Quite simply, this map explains it all. In South Asia, you can see that India and Nepal is a tiny, tiny population in Pakistan. And we know now that the uh, population in uh, Jammu and Kashmir is found in the Katwa Plains, is the northernmost range of the species, beyond which there is a tiny population in Himachal Pradesh. In Southeast Asia, we have the most uh, fragmented population because that's the population which is most endangered now. It's less than, perhaps less than 500 birds. And the future of those birds looks extremely bleak given how much development uh, planning is going on in that region. And finally, a population that we knew very little about, but I started working on this species, on this population in Australia, in uh, Queensland, a few years ago, and now we know a lot more about this population. And we also know that the behavior of the of the Saras in Australia is very, very similar to what we've been seeing in India, except for the habitat where it uses eucalyptus forests in Australia. So it's very odd 
uh, situation in Australia where it's a forest bird, but whereas in India, as most of us will know, it is a bird of the plains. So the Saras is uh, extremely well entrenched in Indian culture. This is a, a depiction of uh, the uh, opening shlok of the Ramayana where Valmiki is thought to have cursed the hunter while he was observing a courting pair of Saras cranes. The hunter shot a bird dead and Valmiki is thought to have cursed the hunter that may he never know love. And that is what the Ramayana begins with, which as we know is one of the most important epics for uh, our religion Hinduism that is prominent in this uh, country. In addition, the Saras also is probably the bird uh, that was first worked on ornithologically, meaning uh, Emperor Aurangzeb banded the Saras cranes, putting gold bangles on different legs of the Saras's. And he is the first person to have written about the incubation period, about the male and female behaviors. And he followed his semi-captive Saras cranes for many, many years. And he's made some really interesting notes which actually form the beginning of the ornithological component of Saras crane. So they, the Saras's not only have a cultural history, but they also have a very interesting ornithological history uh, in South Asia. In India, uh, to sort of jump into the stuff because we, are, uh, we don't have too much time, I'll go over what the uh, new discoveries have been over the last 10 to 15 years. And we've discovered that the Saras cranes in India have three different what you might call behavioral populations. They are not strictly genetic populations because we don't think they are fragmented like in Southeast Asia. Uh, one of the behavioral populations uh, which is very prominently known now because of my work in uh, Uttar Pradesh and uh, some of my colleagues who worked uh, for much longer than I had in Gujarat is that uh, this is uh, a behavior of territorial pairs remaining on their territories all year round. And in those locations, it's also very common to see non-breeding flocks all year round. And these flocks are usually younger birds, which either don't have a partner or don't have territories yet to start breeding. And the blue on the map are largely the areas where we have so far recorded the year round territorial pairs. Very little work has been done in Madhya Pradesh. And there is some work that has just started in Maharashtra. So we hope to have new information to show to you uh, very soon. So the territorial pairs have a behavior that uh, all of us may be famous, uh, all of us may be very familiar with. It's famously known as the Saras dance, but this is not actually a dance. This is a unison call where the male and the female both call in uh, uh, together or unison as it's called. And it, from far away for an untrained ear, it will sound as if it is a single bird calling. And in this photograph, it shows you their behavior in places which have a very high density of cranes. So the birds on the left, which is the, they are doing the unison call, are on the border with another territorial pair, which is beside their territory. And you can see the birds on the right are pretending as if nothing is happening. So this is called the displacement preening, where they're pretending that our territory is here. We don't really see you and we don't really care that you're there. And every morning in places which have very high densities, you can see Saras's go all around their territory displaying like this to the neighboring pairs and it's a wonderful way for ecologists and for conservationists to figure out what the territory is of a single pair without doing too much uh, interactions like catching the birds or uh, something that uh, might damage the birds when you catch such a huge uh, species. And what we discovered very recently through uh, my colleague, my student, but actually he's my colleague, he knows way more than I do now about this. And these are spectrograms or visual representations of how a Saras unison call looks like. And you can see that there are two different kinds of calls, one very thin one and one very fat one in the graphs. And these are the male and the female birds. And what we discovered recently is that the unison call of each pair is distinct when you put it on a spectrogram. It's like our thumbprint. So no two unison calls seem to be alike when we make spectrograms of them. And this uh, may turn out to be a very promising tool to look at population densities, to look at changes of uh, behavior, to look at uh, sizes of pairs and a whole lot of potential work could be done using this uh, technology. And once again, we don't really have to disturb the birds too much. We just have to record their calls. So we are discover discovering that their behavior combined with uh, thoughtful uh, technology can actually serve to understand not just the species, but potentially develop tools for their monitoring and conservation. So this is a photograph from Uttar Pradesh. You can see the dark green at the bottom of the screen. And that is a very small wetland piece that the farmer has left aside. And they use such very small wetlands to take grasses for their uh, uh, cattle and so on. And if a Saras crane has even a tiny bit of wetland like this in their territory, then that is the place that they will use for nesting year after year. 
So the SARS, for SARS Korean conservation, you really shouldn't be looking at uh, only conserving very large wetlands, but actually figuring out how to make sure that farmer habits of retaining tiny wetlands like this all across the landscapes in their thousands can be made possible. It is probably not possible to do this via policy, but it is probably possible uh, to do this via working with the panchayats and working with the uh, farmers who have retained this uh, particular working philosophy for literally uh, thousands of years. So the Saris cranes, when I started the work, I was told that they will abandon the nests. I should be very careful by, for not visiting the nest. They will leave their eggs and go away. But clearly, the cranes of Itawa and Mainpuri had not read any of the books that I had been working with. And the first nest that I visited, the cranes attacked me. And that was a wonderful indication of how strong there was a trust between the human beings and the Saraces. The Saraces were super confident that this particular human being was not going to affect the bird negatively and it was bold enough to attack. And we can use behaviors like this to actually understand whether the human beings on a particular landscape are actually being beneficial to the Saras cranes or whether they are affecting the birds negatively. So in areas where they run away or fly away or they are flying very silently, then we know that landscape. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. All right, sorry. So uh, we've been using a whole bunch of behaviors like this to discover really wonderful things about the Saraces and also be able to take pictures like this using very, very small lenses in places where we study them. And of course, we don't stay at the nest for long. We very, very quickly leave the place so that the birds are not disturbed. And uh, the Saraces are very useful for uh, population biologists because since they remain in their territories, you, have to, you only have to visit each territory periodically. And in this particular territory, you can see there is a lot of wetlands. There is a whole bunch of uh, fields in the background and young chicks are raised inside these territories uh, and they are raised there for about uh, 11 months or so until the coming of the next monsoon season. The monsoon rains is the time when the Saras cranes breed the most in India. That is the most number of eggs are laid. And so it's a very small uh, window of time in which we can uh, go and collect very good information on the breeding requirements of this particular species. This is a very, very small uh, uh, you know, portion of a flock. Flocks of 100 to 400 are still very common in Uttar Pradesh uh, throughout the year. And in slightly drier areas like Rajasthan, Gujarat and Haryana, these larger flocks are only seen in the summers when water dries out on the landscape and they are forced to congregate in the last remaining water bodies. But flocks are as important as breeding pairs because these are the buffer in case anything should happen to the breeding pairs then very quickly paired birds from flocks can take over those territories and make sure that the breeding population doesn't decline. So in very good places like many areas in Uttar Pradesh, about 50% of the population in any area are actually flocks, which is an indicative of very good breeding success. So the second kind of population that we have are, uh, these are pairs that maintain territories only during the breeding season because otherwise it dries out. And this is Gujarat, uh, some parts of uh, uh, MP and Maharashtra and of course Rajasthan and uh, Eastern UP which dries out quite quite a bit. And uh, uh, this is uh, an example of uh, places where the Saraces are forced to leave in the dry season and this is in the Aravalis. We have now discovered that quite fascinatingly the Saraces are not just taking over the Aravalis but they are actually increasing in numbers partly because of governmental schemes that are bringing in new canals to the system, but also partly we suspect because nobody had really explored these areas, assuming that Saraces are birds of the plains. So they are discovering something every year new about the cranes, uh, which keeps us uh, humble in the sense that there is no real one person who can become an expert on the species, because this one species is able to use such a diversity of uh, habitats, such a diversity of uh, farmlands in uh, just one country. <clears throat> so here uh, flocks, like I said, uh, occur only during the dry season and this is a great time to do population estimations, but you have to do this a little bit carefully because in areas where water remains, then not all of the birds will leave their territory. So you still have to be a little bit careful about population, population estimations of birds like the Saras because of their uh, slightly complex behavior. And then finally, we have uh, territorial pairs only during the breeding, which have winter movements, which is almost as if it's a migratory species. And that's the small population in Himachal Pradesh, where the numbers of the Saraces are actually increasing. Some people suspect that this increase is linked to the warming up that is happening due to climate change, which is allowing crops like rice and wheat 
to come up even at higher places in the Himalayas. And uh, the Saras is like in UP, of course, they love areas with rice because the whole area resembles uh, natural wetlands. And where the farmers don't uh, hurt them or chase them, then they can uh, actually do a very good job of uh, raising their chicks. So this is a photograph of the Himachal birds uh, found in, uh, which was first discovered in Pong Dam. And now my colleagues in Punjab tell me that it's very likely that these birds migrate to Punjab every winter. And in Punjab, now it seems like they started to breed again after a very, very long time. So uh, the, every year is full of surprises when we uh, come to the Saras grades. We have now discovered a new social unit. Previously, social units would be either the territorial breeding pair or the non-breeding flocks. And recently, we've discovered something known as trios, which is three birds staying together. This is extremely unusual. This is the first time trios have been seen in cranes. And trios of Saras cranes are uh, quite interesting in that we found that they are both polygynous and polyandrous, meaning trios can have two females, one male, or they can have two males and one female. When there are trios, usually the territory quality is very bad, that the wetlands are either very, very small or the crop pat cropping pattern is such that it's not very conducive to raising chicks. And we saw that areas with trios, the trios were able to re raise chicks almost as equivalently to areas that were uh, much higher quality. So the uh, reason for them to form trios, a species that was famous for making sure that the territory was not invaded by other cranes, seems to be that it helps the parents to raise the chicks. And if you look at these uh, spectrograms, we were able to record spectrograms of triads uh, of trios, and we had to give it a new name because there was no name for uh, the unison call of three cranes. And so we gave it a name of triet to match the duet. And if you can see the spectrogram, it's sort of identical in structure in the sense that you have male birds, female birds, and you have these stacks of calls that are very, very similar structurally. So this is a very new uh, finding and it's very exciting in the sense that uh, as conditions potentially change in the landscapes or, or as climate changes, it may be possible that Saras cranes undergo very, very serious behavioral changes like allowing a third bird to come into its territory uh, potentially to help raise chicks. So what are the needs of the Saras cranes? So one of the very, very clear, uh, you know, uh, the trends have been that if there are more wetlands, small, big, large, medium, no matter what type, if there are more wetlands, then we have cranes in that area raising more chicks. If you have tiny wetlands, a large number of tiny wetlands, then a large number of pairs are able to raise more chicks. Because larger wetlands are used by flocks, usually very large wetlands will have very, very few breeding pairs because they're very territorial and also the flocks don't allow too many pairs to breed in uh, a single wetland. So our usual conventional uh, protectional uh, habit of conserving very large wetlands will be very suitable for birds like ducks, storks and other birds, but it may, may not be suitable for encouraging the increase of breeding pairs of sarasas. We have to focus on very small wetlands that are uniformly spread out across the landscape that allows them to be territorial. So breeding, we also noticed, is better during what we can call as normal rainfall. Of course, now with climate change, we don't know what normal means because rainfall is no longer uh, mostly spread across five months. Sometimes it occurs in two months. Sometimes in some areas, it's beginning to the entirety of the rainfall of a season is occurring in one month. So we don't know what normal means, but if there is enough rainfall across the entire, uh, you know, the rainy season, then breeding is much, much better. And one of the effects that we've seen of drought years is they will try to breed outside of the monsoonal years. And we've noticed that cranes all across India do this, especially if there are leaky irrigation canals that allow water to be there even in the drier seasons. So this combination of human effect of climate change that prevents them from raising chicks in one season, in the normal season, seems like there's another human uh, related stuff like canals that is allowing them to breed outside of the, uh, you know, normal breeding season. So it's very interesting how humans are uh, affecting this particular species. And this species is now becoming a flagship of what can be called as coexistence. So these are graphs uh, on the right that show the population modeling that we've done in some of the areas. And the prognosis for many areas is not very good. You can see that in 50 to 80 years in some of the areas which have very good populations of cranes, uh, 50 to 100 years, we are seeing that it's likely that the population of cranes will reduce to less than half. And the primary reason for that is concretization. No other variable included in this population model affected crane populations as much and as fast as concretization. And you can see in the photograph, even places like Itawa and Mainpuri, which uh, 
have the highest density of cranes anywhere in the world is now becoming harder and harder for the cranes to retain their territory. This is the foremost threat and unfortunately, it's also a permanent threat. You can't really remove private houses or institutions or buildings or industries once they come up. So that is something that we really need to watch out. And if we want this species to continue to live on our landscape, we really have to start planning, uh, looking at the whole landscape rather than individual units of land owned by individuals. So as an example, I'll show you what we've been seeing in Anand and Kheda districts in Gujarat, which also has very high density of cranes. And you will see here the hexagons, which are roughly 10 square kilometers in size. The bright red ones are the ones that are almost entirely concretized, that they, that they are urbanized. And this is the map of Anand and Kheda put together. And if you overlay where the cranes are found, then you can see that they have now started to, the number of pairs that used to occur in the middle of Anand and Kheda are now uh, slowly being taken away by the concretization. So obviously, as cities begin to merge and as villages begin to expand, we are going to see uh, removal of crane pairs on a permanent basis because they don't really have anywhere else to go since the landscape is uh, saturated with crane pairs, as we can see with the presence of non-breeding flocks. So this is the biggest threat. And as you can see from this map, some of the trends that we are seeing are actually quite fast, and I mean, surprisingly fast. And it is something that we should really be worried about. Electrification of the countryside. So this particular shot, unfortunately, I did not take a photograph when I started this work in 1998. This photograph was taken in 2015, I think. And all of these wires, every single one of the wires that you see is new in 2015. There was not a single wire here in, 2000, uh, in, in 1999 when I began the study. This particular pair has figured out how to avoid the wires. And it's a very, very good uh, pair. They're very good parents. They're able to raise one or two chicks every year. But not all crane parents or, uh, or crane chicks are as good at figuring out novel, novel wires. And the deaths due to electrocution or due to the impact of hitting the wires, because the cranes can fly at 40 to 60 kilometers per hour on a normal flight, and they're much faster if they're doing long distance flights. So the result usually is deadly because they have hollow bones. And when they fall on the ground, then there is uh, usually a lethal impact uh, due to hitting the wires. So this is the next most important threat that we are seeing. And then, then there is a whole bunch of other threats like uh, pesticide poisoning, dogs that are increasing. And of course, photographers who are now becoming less and less uh, ethical because they want to have more likes every morning uh, when they put their photographs on either Twitter or uh, you know, Facebook or what have you. So that is, those are all uh, minor threats, but these are very important threats that we need to continue to pay attention to. So what do the Saracis eat? They are omnivorous. They eat pretty much anything. They eat uh, a lot of animal uh, stuff. They eat frogs, turtles. They eat eggs of other birds. They eat a whole bunch of snails and uh, uh, grasses and shoots. And they eat practically everything that we grow next to them. So they eat potatoes, peas, wheat, rice, joby. I mean, anything that the farmer plants, the Saracis eat. So it is partly because of this wonderful habit of you know, uh, switching, being able to switch diets throughout the year with the seasons, with the crops. And because the farmers don't persecute them, that's the reason why we continue to have the world's highest population of Saras cranes. So how do we ensure the long-term survival of Saras cranes? Because all of this sounds very interesting. All of this sounds in a way grim. Is there a future for the Saras cranes? That's a question that uh, of course is uh, on my mind and, and on the mind of many people in the forest department uh, continually and for a very long time. And what we have learned over the last 20 to 25 years is we really need to figure out which the areas are with good populations and let them be. Those areas should not be disturbed in terms of you know, tourism or interventions for uh, uh, habitat improvement. They already have good populations. We should not be meddling with anything there. So Itawa Mainpuri is a fantastic example where if we can continue to encourage the farmers, where we can continue to restrict the expansion of concretization, that's all that place needs. It doesn't need anything else. Any other intervention that we do is not likely to be fully beneficial to the cranes. Some interventions are, of course, like you know, reducing pesticides. Of course, it will be very good for the cranes. But other things like tourism and improving access to the cranes via other activities, they are not likely to be good for, for the cranes, given how territorial they are and given how sensitive they are, despite living with the farmers. They like farmers, but they don't really like uh, people who are not farmers. So we should be very careful about not going into areas with cranes, assuming that they are uh, fully uh, sensitized to all human beings. That's not true. Also, 
there is now a trend of copying conservation techniques from the West. And so monetizing conservation has now become a fashion in India, especially with the uh, NGOs, because all NGOs like the one that uh, I work with and like the ones that I work with, they need money to survive, you know, right? We don't have payment from the government. Our salaries are raised every year. So obviously we need some form of making sure that we keep getting money. And unfortunately, this is leading to us diluting and destroying age old cultures of farmers and other people conserving species like the Saras cranes, because in many areas now they no longer want to conserve cranes unless you give them money. And this is now true in Southeast Asia, where many areas it's simply impossible to conserve cranes without paying the farmers every year. Imagine if that happens in India, how many farmers you have to pay every year and how unsustainable that would be. And what a tragedy it would be to lose this uh, wonderful culture of coexistence and bonhomie that the cranes have with the uh, farmers simply because we want to have a few projects in our organizations. So this really needs to stop. And I don't know how we can uh, work with nonprofits and stuff to stop it because it is really what conservationists call a super sexy, you know, go to India, you give a few thousand dollars and we can impact, you know, that's the kind of language that Westerner, Western conservationists speak with. So we really need to fight it and tell them that, you know, in our country, there are other ways to do it and we want to keep our culture. So unless we fight the Western forms of conservation, many of which are, of course, very useful, but many of which are not useful, uh, we will risk losing this culture that we have. And we need to essentially preserve all existing wetlands. The question of which wetlands to preserve is long gone because the amount of wetlands that currently exist in India is way, way lesser than what we need for the wetlands to have ecosystem values. Across Uttar Pradesh, for example, less than 2 or 3% of Uttar Pradesh, in some areas, about 10% of Uttar Pradesh are wetlands. And that is far too little for a floodplain landscape, which is tropical and subtropical in nature. In temperate areas, they require 15 to 20 percent of the landscape to be wetlands for the wetlands to continue to have ecosystem values. So clearly, we have lost a huge amount of ecosystem value of wetlands. And the question of which wetlands to preserve should no longer come in our mind. And also, we should preserve all wetlands without any plans for concretizing them. We have to definitely stop, dissuade and discourage people who want to build walking paths, who want to make concrete, who want to... Uh, make the sides steep, we have to stop all of that because uh, species like sarases, as we know, require shallow wetlands. Ducks will do very well with deep wetlands, but not species like cranes. So we have to preserve all existing wetlands of all sizes. And that is something that we have come to an understanding over the last 25 years because we are losing wetlands very rapidly. And the wetlands that are being taken over for conservation are being destroyed because of concretization and a whole bunch of other developmental activities which are being done in in a you know with a favorable mind but it is not ecologically feasible to maintain them as healthy wetlands for species like cranes and then of course it goes without saying that we have to find ways to encourage and retain traditional farming and like i mentioned briefly during the talk leaky canals are really good for cranes they are good for a whole bunch of species people in uttar pradesh will know about it people in rajasthan and gujarat know about it and in fact most places where we have irrigated canals uh, farming the landscapes people who look at birds and animals know that canals that are leaky are very very good for a wide number of species and definitely very good for maintaining a large number of tiny wetlands for saras cranes across multiple states so we really have to encourage and retain not just the kind of crops that are going on, but also see if it is possible for us within the uh, burgeoning population that we have and within the challenges that are increasing in terms of getting water to people, can we also ensure that there are some leakages somewhere uh, or to keep the traditional ways of canal systems going. And about photographers, I really don't know what to say and uh, what we can do about the photographers because the large majority of photographers in India are actually quite educated, they're from big cities, they're from IT or from the, you know, from the share market industry. So they're very, very educated. But somehow we have gotten into an addiction of having our photographs put up every day and getting a million likes. And the sources, unfortunately, because they're just out there, they're not in protected areas and the farmers are really, you know, paying attention to their own jobs. They are unfortunately easy targets and the vast majority of photographs that you see on Saras's today, you can make out in the photograph that the cranes are disturbed. They're walking away, they're calling loudly, they're uh, running away with their chicks. So clearly photography, while it can be a very good tool, and of course not all photographers are unethical, and there are many who do very good work and also help with conservation. The vast majority simply seem to be addicted and they don't. I really don't know what we can do about ensuring that we can bring back ethical photography. And this is something that we need to have a national level discussion on. 
So thank you very much for this opportunity. Once again, I hope I have not gone over my time and uh, I look forward to the questions that might come up at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gopi, for giving such an insightful talk on the research that you've done on the species in focus, as well as the long term challenges that the species faces in terms of conservation. We will take question and answers for this session at the end. We now move on to the second part of today's talk, which is on Know Your Zoo. So joined in today with us is Dr. H. Raja Mohan, who is the Chief Conservator of Forests and the Director of the Shahid Ashwak Ulal Khan Prani of the so, Dr. Mohan is an Indian Forest Service officer of the 2001 batch from the Uttar Pradesh cadre. He has done his doctorate from the Indian Agricultural Indian Agriculture Research Institute, Pusaro Delhi, in entomology, and has worked briefly as a scientist as well. Post joining the service, Dr. Mohan has worked in several uh, several protected areas in Uttar Pradesh, and he was also the first uh, field director of the new, of the then newly established Pilibhit Tiger Reserve. Dr. Mohan also has a special interest in bird watching as well as butterfly watching, and he will speak to us today more on the newly established zoo. So over to you, sir. Dr. Mohan, can you hear me? It is just coming. Uh, okay. Wait a little bit, ma'am. Okay. All right. So then, in that case, we will uh, we'll move on to the question answers. We'll wait for a minute in case sir has, uh, I think, moved on for another meeting. In case it's not possible, we'll take up question answers in a minute. Okay, sir? Yes, so you can can you can I'm begin. I'm yes, you're audible. audible. Yes, sir, you're audible. Please begin your talk. Thank uh, CZA for giving us this opportunity on the 65th week of uh, Azati Amrit Mahostav. Also, I also thank Dr. Gopi Sundar, scientist Seva Mandir, for his excellent uh, presentation. And uh, there are a lot of many new things to me. Even though I worked in uh, Western UP, where Saras is uh, abundance. In particularly in near Matra, and uh, we used to go to uh, circle meeting in Agra, and we used to, used to see a lot of uh, Saras cranes in um, uh, Yatawa, Mainpuri, and all. But uh, the the scientific uh, things about Saras in the in the very dear depth uh, he has explained, and um, I'm very thankful to him. And we have a lot of uh, questions also. I have some personal questions to ask him on the last. We'll keep that one. And before that, uh, I will uh, just uh, finish this uh, introduction to this uh, new zoo. Uh, I will take only some 10 minutes. So this uh, zoo is uh, Shahid Ashish Pulwakan uh, Prani Udyan Gorakhpur. And uh, <coughs> this has been uh, uh, operational since uh, 2021, uh, March 27th. Uh, this has been named after uh, the famous uh, uh, freedom fighter Ashish Ullah Khan, who belongs uh, basically belongs to Saranpur, uh, Sajanpur uh, district of Uttar Pradesh, but he, he was you know, involved in that uh, Kakori uh, train robbery case in 1925, and he was hanged uh, by the British government in 27 at the early very young age of 27 years of old. So this was uh, named after him, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, this zoo. Uh, was built within the record uh, period of uh, three years. It started in the uh, July, July uh, 2017 and finished by uh, 1920. Because of uh, COVID, there was some delay in uh, completion of this work. Next one, please. This is the outlay of the zoo where we have uh, uh, three components, uh, rather four components, which will be uh, self explanatory in the next slide. Uh, we have an exhibit area of uh, 20.35 hectares, a wetland area, 
13.7 hectares where we get a lot of uh, uh, migratory birds during season from October to March. And a forest woodland area, uh, particularly com com comprising of uh, uh, Arjun and uh, Jamun trees of 12 hectares, where we find a lot of uh, birds during the season. And quarantine rescue facility with the hospital and residential area of uh, 2.96 hectares. All put together is 49.10 hectares. And still we have some uh, uh, some area left uh, away from our campus, just adjoining our campus, which may be in the due course of uh, time, we have requested the honorable CM to uh, attach it with the uh, zoo. So there's a possibility of uh, handing over that area to us, which is uh, basically uh, uh, with the, uh, the Gorakhpur Development Authority, which we call as a GDA. So there's a lot of scope to expand this zoo as a zoo uh, safari and uh, also a uh, botanical garden. Uh, this is a uh, Google map of the zoo. The yellow uh, outline is the, the exhibit area where visitors are allowed. And the blue area is the wetland adjoining the famous Ramgarh Tal of uh, Gorakhpur. And uh, the green outline area is the uh, forest land. And the red one is the uh, other building and the other structures, uh, our infrastructure area, uh, like our residential complex, uh, veterinary hospital, rescue centers, postmortem house, incinerators, kitchen, etc. So uh, we have uh, 33 enclosures initially um, uh, for various birds, uh, reptiles, and animals, and one veterinary hospital, hospital, and uh, kitchen feed store. Quarantine center, four uh, rescue center, and uh, postmortem house and incinerator, each one. And uh, when you see the pu public facilities, we have cafeteria, kiosk, 70 theater, resting sheds, benches, and toilet blocks. And I have to mention here that the 70 theater, which we have a facility here, is one of the uh, state of art uh, facility, not uh, in the government uh, organization UP. Only some uh, theme parks and the malls would have it. And it's a very good uh, 70 theater. We are uh, successfully running it uh, with uh, uh, full crowd. And uh, this uh, this is a uh, main attraction in the zoo. Apart from that, we have all types of uh, residential facilities for from the director to the uh, zookeeper and other uh, class four employees. So we see a glimpse of the zoo. There are uh, uh, to, uh, at present there are 38 pieces of uh, animals, birds, and reptiles. Uh, number of animals is uh, the number is 224. We started the zoo with 150, and now it is around after 180 is 224. The footfall for the 2021-22 uh, is uh, seven lakh around seven lakh eight thousand, which is uh, very good. Uh, when we say that initially, uh, we thought of we have uh, some apprehensions uh, whether uh, it will pick or not. But uh, seeing the rush, we can uh, assure that uh, the expansion of zoo and uh, bring new things to zoo will attract more. Uh, public because this is the only zoo in the uh, eastern UP which covers uh, not only the eastern UP of uh, eastern UP but also uh, Bihar and uh, Nepal. And uh, the rescue center we have here, and we have two veterinarians and uh, they are doing wonderful work here. We have rescued already 171 animals, uh, consist of birds, mammals, and reptiles. Here, the problem is arises with the uh, uh, in we have two sanctuaries here nearby around 100 kilometers. We have a lot of uh, human animal conflict with uh, leopards. Leopards stay out and uh, it kills uh, the kids and uh, the, in, in retaliation, the uh, villagers kill uh, leopard. So uh, earlier time before this zoo, uh, the team has to come from uh, uh, either from Lucknow or from Kanpo, which is around uh, 250 kilometers to 350 kilometers. But nowadays, within an hour, we will reach the spot and we rescued some uh, five leopards and we have uh, successfully treated it and we have uh, returned it to the wild. So as I told that uh, this uh, zoo has a special attraction of uh, 70 theater where people enjoy uh, the movement and the bubbles coming out of the uh, hall. And we have uh, connected this zoo with the eco, eco, uh, Gorak eco tourism circuit. Uh, as per our uh, CM's um, uh, order, we have created a eco tourism circuit in, uh, circuits in three areas, so Varanasi, uh, Agra and Gorakhpur. The uh, Gorakhpur Eco Tourism Circuit consists of this uh, two sanctuaries, the zoo and the uh, Gorakhpur division. So, this is also on the pipeline. This will be uh, already has been initiated, trial dance has been uh, conducted. 
this will create a new uh, adventure uh, one day program for the public and as we see the awareness we have um, personally written to the most of the schools and uh, because uh, uh, the students are the main uh, uh, main visitors of the zoo so we have written a lot of uh, to the lot of schools and the uh, educators uh, requesting them to send the uh, students we have a lot of uh, um, concession for them 10% yes, for the and awareness we have generated some around uh, 859 schools have visited with their students since we have a um, uh, concession package uh, they are very eager in visiting the zoo so i'll uh, quickly run out this um, slides uh, just to give a uh, overall uh, view of this zoo this is a entrance uh, signage building near our zoo uh, beside our gate this is our uh, main entrance gate of our zoo which has been designed uh, very uh, ethically and uh, very um, uh, by, by our own uh, CMSR uh, based on the uh, Gorakhpur Mandir. This is the outline of Gorakhpur Mandir. He has given this shape to this zoo. This is our administrative building where we sit and uh, where we are now uh, doing our business. These are the few enclosures. We try to enrich it with, uh, uh, as per the CZS norms, we are enriching it with uh, uh, all type of um, enrichments. This is a ca kiosk inside the zoo. Lion, leopard, crocodiles. And thank you, thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you so much, sir, for giving an overview of the newly established Gorakhpur Zoo. So we now move on to the question and answer session for today's talk. Uh, so Dr. Gopi will take up questions for you first. And so the first question for you is that um, uh, do are the trios that the Saras train form lifelong, or does the non-breeding uh, or does the non-breeding pairs event the non-breeding individuals eventually pair off or switch to another pair? And the second part of this uh, second part of this question is that habitat condition seems to be a factor in the trio formation. Does the Saris population dens is Sar is the Saris population density also a factor in this? Ah, thank you for the question. I mean, we are just learning new things about the trio, uh, and so we know a limited amount. But what we know so far is that the third bird doesn't seem to take part in the mating. So it seems to leave the territory when the breeding happens. And uh, we are seeing trios, no matter what the density of the cranes are, we are seeing trios everywhere. Or oh, wherever there are cranes uh, in, uh, all across South Asia, we have seen trios. And now trios are also being reported from Australia and other places with Saras cranes. Uh, in terms of habitat, uh, you know, when we have uh, poor habitat on the larger landscape, poor meaning for the cranes, not necessarily for everybody else. So when you have more forests, then that's poor habitat for the cranes, right? So when you have poor habitat for the cranes, then the number of pairs that you find on the landscape are obviously going to be very low. So in areas which have very low uh, densities of cranes, we are seeing a higher preponderance of trios, which sort of makes sense because that's where they need the most help for uh, raising the young. We haven't yet followed up on the trios. We've seen one young male that associates as a trio. So we know that it's probably young birds that become part of the trio. But what happens to them, how long they stay on uh, as part of the trio, when do they move on to uh, territories of their own, or do they stay on and become uh, you know, the new owner of the territory that they were invited in. We don't know the answers to any of these questions. And because trios are so rare, so their trios were, uh, you know, uh, less than 2% uh, of, uh, sorry, less than 0.2% uh, uh, of all of the sightings that we had. And we've only seen about 190 trios after 20 years of work. And so it's a, obviously a very rare phenomenon. So we, there's a lot more that we don't know than uh, what we know about trios. Right, sir. And so the next question for you is that how are the pairs identified in the wild or in the agricultural lands? And do the pairs not leave the territory? Do not do the pairs not leave their territories year round? So, like I showed you in this slideshow, there are uh, populations where they never leave because the places like Itawa, Mainpuri, that sir was talking about, and also Mathura, and those areas have very good irrigation canals. And because of the irrigation canals, and also because the farmers primarily put rice during uh, the monsoon season because of the uh, volume of rains. There is water more or less throughout the year or at least uh, in the season when they require to raise the chick. So in these areas, they don't need to leave the territories at all. 
And if you, like I showed you in the photographs, you can actually sit far away and watch the pairs early in the mornings. Uh, and the pairs will go around their entire territory and display to their neighboring uh, pairs. So you can actually figure out what the territory of a crane is if you're a little bit patient. It'll require a lot of visits and so on. But uh, you can quite easily figure out and you are likely to learn a lot of good things uh, in the process as well. Right, sir. So in line with that, the next question is that what are the what how large is the home range of the species? Uh, you mean uh, pairs uh, within different populations will have different home ranges. And uh, as we know, for all animals, the healthier the territory, the smaller the uh, territory uh, size. So in places like Itawa, Mainpuri and uh, some of the other uh, rich wetlands of Gujarat, Haryana and Uttar Pradesh, the territory size can be as small as uh, half a hectare. They don't need more than half a hectare for the full year. So you imagine how healthy Indian wetlands are. And there is no crane in the world, no other crane species in the world that, that has such a small territory, suggesting that our wetlands and our landscapes are by far uh, one of the healthiest in the world for uh, cranes. But in areas like Gujarat, Rajasthan and also eastern UP and uh, northern UP where uh, you have the hydrology is very different or, or you have a large amount of forests in the area like in Madhya Pradesh and stuff, there the territory sizes can be uh, 5 to 8 square kilometer. So it can be very, very wide. So it really depends on the quality of the territory and also the water content that remains in the territory, uh, that usable water. Because, you know, in Uttar Pradesh, we have areas that get fully flooded, which cannot be used by cranes because it's a river in spit. So obviously those are not good areas. Right, sir. And so the next question for you is that uh, how do uh, how does pesticide or how does the use of pesticide or insecticide affect the population of the birds around? And uh, and the, what is the outlook of farmers, uh, farmers wherein these birds have established? What is the outlook of farmers who live in the territories where these birds have, uh, who live in the area, who uh, work in the areas where, the, where these territories are established? So the uh, the good sign, like I showed you the territory, the some of the behavioral photographs, the cranes choose to attack you when you visit the nest in Uttar Pradesh. And this is not a common behavior in many parts of other parts of India, which means that UP, Haryana and some of those areas, the farmers don't really hurt the birds at all. And that's why the birds are bold enough to attack you when you come to the nest. Whereas in other areas, they'll fly away. They'll just fly away. In Gujarat, there are places where uh, potentially because of hunting or other things, the birds don't even call when they fly. Whereas people in Uttar Pradesh will be familiar with the flight call. When the birds are calling, then there'll be a single note that each bird produces. And you can hardly hear that in some parts of uh, Gujarat and uh, MP. So uh, these are good cues for us to know that the farmers are doing a very good job in many parts of India, Nepal, and also in Australia, where they're not really worried about the farmers because the farmers don't affect the birds negatively. We do have some instances where uh, outsiders or even some of the locals can remove eggs. Like recently, we are figuring out that in Madhya Pradesh, the cranes are probably not doing very well because the farmer relationship there does not seem to be as strong as in Uttar Pradesh. So you have some variations like that. And so in those areas, there may be requirement for us to do a lot more work. In terms of crops and pesticides, it really depends on the crops. So in areas with uh, soybean in Madhya Pradesh, for example, you hardly see cranes because the amount of pesticide is so much that not many living things can survive there. You can't eat an insect because they, you imbibe a lot of pesticides. You cannot eat a lizard because you imbibe a lot of pesticides. So in those areas with uh, uh, crops like soybean, which require a huge amount of pesticide input, you don't find too many species, including cranes. Whereas in places like Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat, where the monsoon has a wonderful uh, dilution effect every season, we are seeing that they wash off, uh, literally wash off a lot of the chemicals and a lot of the bad things from the landscape every year. And in those areas, it seems like pesticides don't seem to be accumulating in these birds like they have accumulated in the West for bald eagles and stuff. And the way that the cranes are dying is when the crops, when they are ripening, they are sprayed with crops just before the ripening and the cranes go in and eat the crops because they, the crops are part of their diet. And at that time, the accumulation is so much that we do see uh, small flocks of cranes and also individual uh, birds and chicks dying because they've just eaten too much pesticide at one go. Right, sir. So uh, the next question was that uh, does the cropping practices affect the breeding ecology and nesting success in the cranes? So I think this partially answers the question as well that uh, that it does affect. The next uh, question for you, sir, is that what is the best habitat for Saras crane in Rajasthan and uh, why has the breeding of Saras cranes reduced over the years? 
So the crane breeding has not necessarily reduced. I mean, it's changed over the years as in areas where new construction and new very large pro projects have done. And, you know, India is a poor country. We still don't have villagers with, uh, with roads. So we do need these construction projects. But in areas where such things have happened, then cranes have just been removed from the landscape. The ones that are persisting continue to breed. In places like Rajasthan, they hardly ever are able to use the fields because we don't have rice cropping in places like Rajasthan. We have the, there the Saras cranes only breed beside or inside wetlands. So they are very uniform, sort of very widely scattered across the landscape. And even in the Aravali, any practically any wetland that you go to, which is not very deep, there you can find a pair of cranes and a pair of storks and so on. In Uttar Pradesh, of course, it's very, very different. It's a magical landscape uh, in terms of uh, habitat for large water birds. No matter where you go, I mean, you end up bumping into a large water bird like Saras or black neck storks. So UP is a very, very sort of an outlier in the global, uh, uh, you know, the ecology of large water birds. And there probably isn't any other area in the world like Uttar Pradesh where such a high density of people, such a high amount of farming and farming for such a long period of time. You know, Uttar Pradesh is supposed to be one of the places where agriculture began. Where agriculture for humanity possibly began in uh, Uttar Pradesh and in one other area in uh, in the Middle East. And so agriculture has been going on here for 10 to 12,000 years. And despite all of that, we are seeing the largest populations of the world like Saras cranes, very, very big animals like Nilgai, huge populations of things like, you know, which are of course a pest, things like langurs and other things occurring amidst the people in Uttar Pradesh. So we do really have to understand it a little bit more better because that understanding is going to be very unique to places like Uttar Pradesh. There's no other place in the world like this. So we should not be using rule books from other countries or rule books from other species to try and implement in places like this because that can also become partly damaging. All right, the answer moving on to the next question. The question is that if Saras cranes are to be housed in a mixed species exhibit at zoos, what are the potential species that you would suggest would that can be housed together? So if you want to keep the cranes as a breeding pair, then obviously you just need to have the pair. You can't have any other cranes along with them because they will fight. And in Lucknow Zoo, when I started in 98, they were they kept fighting. Uh, and cranes kept dying because at that point we didn't really know. There was no textbook on cranes in the world because nobody had really done a uh, study. And only after our studies in Itawa, Mainpuri, we realized that they are territorial throughout the year. And so Lucknow Zoo was able to separate out the pairs. And then we also realized that they kick out the chicks in the wild when the next breeding season comes. And so Lucknow Zoo was always, the parents were going and killing the chicks. All it required was removing the chicks away from the parents when the chick became 10 to 12, you know, 8 to 10 months of age when the parents started to attack the chicks and then the chick would survive. The uh, the tricky part with cranes is that, of course, they're very big, but they're not very strong because they have hollow bones. So most mixed species exhibits during the breeding season, it's really very difficult to keep cranes because they will attack anything. They will attack rhinos, they will attack, uh, uh, you know, endangered species like Sangha. I saw in Lucknow Zoo and a couple of other zoos we've had very endangered species of deer being kicked very hard by cranes because they were be, they were defensive and they were protecting the nests. And it ended up injuring a very, very valuable deer uh, like the Sangai and other stuff. So if you want to breed cranes uh, in an area, then during the breeding season, if at all it's possible, and, and I know it's very, very complex to do that, they need to be secluded because otherwise they're very aggressive, very territorial. They can hurt themselves in the process and they can hurt another endangered species. And when the chicks grow up, then it's definitely the moment you see the parents starting to peck the chicks, then you immediately have to step in and uh, pull out the chicks and give them a separate uh, enclosure. And then you can uh, successfully raise the species in terms of you know exchanging it with other zoos or pairing up individual. There are a lot of zoos across India and across uh, South Asia and Africa which have single Saras cranes. So the zoos in India have a great potential to uh, look at exchange programs where you can provide a male or a female for a zoo that might require it. Uh, it's not uh, going to be in terms of in terms of uh, conservation value. Fortunately, we have enough and more cranes in the wild. We don't really need to be releasing cranes anywhere. And if cranes are declining in a place, as we all know, just releasing a crane is not going to solve anything because the problems will still be there. So we have to first tackle the problems and the cranes will likely come back by themselves because there is such a lot of surplus cranes out in the wild. So we literally have 10 to 20,000 Saras cranes out there across India, which are without territories. So fortunately, we don't need to do release programs, but we definitely need to secure the very, very long range of the species because with climate change and with development, we don't know uh, how far we can guarantee to 100% the wild success of the cranes. So having a captive population, as we know, is always uh, exceedingly valuable. So trying to get in touch with other zoos in India, which have single Saras's, 
I think Uttar Pradesh and uh, zoos in Haryana and stuff uh, can potentially play a global role in making sure that we have uh, healthy and uh, well-behaved sort of when they're in pairs, they really are much happier and much healthier. And so we can uh, ensure that the cranes in our zoos can uh, have a partner. Right, sir. And uh, so there's another question. The last question for you is that uh, as a species, what do you think uh, as uh, to uh, children, especially, what do you think is the educational value that Saris cranes have? So cranes are very long lived. The longest uh, surviving crane that died is not a Saras. It was a Siberian crane. It was at least 96 years of age. So cranes are, you know, like human beings. They live, they uh, uh, like our, uh, what shall we say, hypothetically perfect human beings, where we live for a very long time and we have only one partner, right? <laughs> so they are almost human in their being and they can live for very, very long periods of time. So both in the wild and also in the zoos, because you have the opportunity to put colored bands on cranes to identify individuals, it is potentially possible to help children attach themselves to an individual because that individual is going to live for a very, very long time. So as we know, uh, most humans attach themselves to animals that they can identify individually. That's why dogs do so well, cats do so well. So if you can put a separately, you know, uh, individually unique colored band on your crane, and then you will you can develop a whole bunch of programs where children come and watch them. And very likely, as the child grows up and becomes a, a, an elderly person, that crane is also likely to be alive. So that is a wonderful bonding where you can form, where you can instill uh, issues of wetland ecology, you can instill issues of, uh, you know, the uh, harm of doing unplanned development and all of that into the children of our country. Right. Thank you, sir. Those were the questions for you. We now move on to questions for uh, Dr. Mohan. So, sir, the first question for you is that yours is a newly established zoo. So, what are what are, what are the future plans of the zoo in terms of expansion or in terms of exhibits? As I already told, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, land behind us, uh, uh, away from our boundary. Uh, that we have some dis dispute with between the forest department of Gorakhpur and with uh, the Gorakhpur Development Authority. And finally, the NGT has given uh, its, its uh, judgment in favor of the government. And the third party was also involved in, the, in this uh, dispute. So now the uh, land has been given to the uh, forest department for management, but it remains uh, on papers uh, with the DDA. The Goku Dauka Dati, and we have requested for this, uh, this land, uh, which is almost equal to this uh, 50 hectares. So, uh, with this uh, amount, we can uh, very well expand the zoo and we can include uh, some uh, uh, botanical garden for safari also. This is one thing. Regarding the species uh, addition, uh, still we have, uh, since this is a new zoo, uh, almost 80% of the animals we, we got from our our, our, we can say, parent zoos like uh, Kanpur and our uh, mentoring zoos, uh, Lucknow. Lucknow is under 100 years, so you may be knowing Lucknow is 100 years old zoo. And almost all animals, 80% of animals came from the, both the zoos. And uh, we, we still have some uh, vacant enclosures like uh, uh, wolf. Uh, we have a cluster from the uh, Zuckerberg from Gujarat. And uh, whatever we have been approved uh, for uh, animal protection, we have some uh, lacunae. Uh, like uh, wolf, uh, like uh, uh, smaller cats, like uh, leopard cat and the fishing cat, these three and the uh, Himalayan black bear. These four species we have to uh, get from other zoos, and we are trying our best uh, to make contact. And uh, we will be in the coming years will be uh, finding some suitable uh, zoos to uh, even we are giving uh, offering that uh, whatever animals you need, you will list and we we'll arrange from the Lucknow and Kanpur too. That's what uh, our uh, wildlife partner told because it's a new zoo. You can't gain anything. You don't have anything. And uh, for uh, uh, conservation breeding, uh, we simply park in the Terai area, and this is the only zoo in Terai region. Gorakhpur is a Terai area, and uh, 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 one-armed rhinoceros has been uh, nominated. We bought uh, two, uh, one pair of rhinoceros from uh, Azam Zoo, State Zoo Azam. So we are also trying to. Uh, Trying to uh, expand that enclosure for conservation building purpose. Right, sir. And so the next question for you is what are some of the facilities available at the zoo pre presently for the engagement of visitors who come? Uh, actually, facilities as per we, uh, we have the uh, toy uh, um, battery operated vehicles uh, to move around, and we have the 70 facility. 
and we are developing our uh, interpretation center. Since last year, we didn't have budget, enough budget. This year, we are now the government has sanctioned 52 rupees as a uh, uh, car cost fund. So, we will be developing that uh, interpretation center. So, uh, operational is uh, only the 7D facility. And we have a lot of uh, other uh, other things like uh, butterfly park, the aquarium, and uh, the, the uh, battery operated vehicle. One operational uh, kiosk inside the zoo. Another one is outside the zoo, which will be operated uh, very uh, the area as the uh, All right, sir. And so the next question for you is that apart from leopards, what are the other uh, free ranging animals that one can see in the zoo premises? No, we don't have leopards here. Because it's, it's almost uh, in between the uh, uh, city we are city. so we don't have leopards. But we have uh, we do had uh, um, nail guys, we had jackals, we had uh, uh, the uh, other uh, mongooses. These are few things we have uh, uh, as uh, uh, mammals. But we have wetland where a lot of uh, uh, birds come, like spot uh, built duck. Whistling that a lot of herons, um, uh, all this uh, water birth which are migrate, uh, we are we have seen through the group, October to March. So we don't have leopards, but uh, we have do have some uh, small carnivores like mackerels. All right, sir. And uh, the last question for you is that since yours is a newly established zoo, what is like the what is the one exhibit or you know what is the facility that is there presently at the zoo which uh, attracts visitors the most? Uh, this is most is uh, the uh, lion we have uh, for Tori. The majestic lion we have is we bought from uh, Gujarat, so we can see a lot of people hanging around there. That is the one thing, and uh, we have. Uh, the series of uh, carnivores in that that end, uh, right from uh, leopard, uh, la, tiger, and lion. These three uh, uh, among these three, uh, lion patori is the, uh, the attraction for the kids uh, here. All right, sir. So those were the questions for you, and with that, we come to the conclusion of our week 65th Know Your Species Know Your Zoo talk. On behalf of the Central Zoo Authority, I would like to thank both Dr. Gopi Sundar and to you, Dr. Rajamohan, for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining us for this talk. I would also like to thank the audience who have been with us throughout, and I hope that you have learned more about the Sarah screen and about the newly established Gorakhpur Zoo from this talk today. And I would also like to inform them that we'll be back next week on Wednesday for a week 50, for a week 66 Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk, which is on the Red Crown Roof Turtle and the Kanpur Zoological Park. So do tune, on, tune in to, for that talk next Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. And on behalf of Caesar Day, once again, thank you to everybody who has joined in. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.